Welcome to week two of Algebra One with Mrs. Weibark. This week we are continuing to discuss functions. We will be talking about function notation, the vertical line test, and arithmetic sequences. A function, remember, is a relation in which each element of the domain is paired with exactly one element of the range. Another way of saying this is that there is one and only one output y for each input x. When we use a function, we say that the input x is entered into the function, and as a result, we get the output y. When using function notation, we allow the letter y, or variable y, in an equation to be replaced by the phrase f of x. In this case, x is the input, y continues to be the output, and f is just the name of the function. We commonly call functions by letters, and because the word function starts with an f, it is very commonly used to refer to functions. So in this example, we have f of x equals 2x squared minus 3x plus 6. Remember that equations have a left side and a right side. In this case, the notation f means that we have a function we are calling f. The x here on the left means that the right-hand side of the equation over here will use the variable x. It is very important to remember that the left side, f of x, does not mean f times x like the parentheses usually do. It simply tells us that we have a function with a variable. And it is very important to know that all the variables must be the same on both the left side of the equation and the right. We can also say that f of x means the function whose input is x, and equations can be written in function notation. This year we've been using equations using x and y, such as y equals negative 4x plus 1. We can replace the y with y of x, which simply means that we are finding y in terms of x. An equation commonly used in science is s equals 0 0.5 times t plus 1.5, and we can rewrite this in function notation to indicate that we are finding s in terms of t. Similarly, if I started with the equation b equals 2a minus 3, I could write it as b of a equals 2a minus 3, which means that I am finding b in terms of a. So while we commonly use f to mean function, it's actually acceptable to use any letter of the alphabet. For example, if we are given that f of x equals 3x minus 2, this means that I have some function in which the output, when given x, is equal to 3x minus 2. So if I'm asked to find f of 3, it means that I will substitute 3 for the x in my function. Therefore, I get 3 times 3 minus 2, which will yield an output of 7. So f of 3 equals 7. If I were asked to find f of negative 2, I would instead substitute x in my function with negative 2, so 3 times negative 2 minus 2 would give me an output of negative 8. So f of negative 2 equals negative 8. You can use a single function and allow x or the input to be any number in the set of real numbers, and you will always get an output. If I were given the function h of z, in which the function equals z squared minus 4z plus 9, and I were asked to find h of negative 3, <clears throat> so I would be putting negative 3 into the function, and I would have negative 3 squared minus 4 times negative 3 plus 9, which would yield an output equivalent to 9 plus 12 plus 9, which of course is 30. Therefore, h of negative 3 equals 30. In this third example, we are using the function g of x, which is equal to x squared minus 2. I would like you to take a moment and find g of 4. That means that you will replace the x in the function with 4. 
take a moment and see what you get. If you replaced x with 4 and got 16 minus 2, you should have come up with the answer 14. Functions can also be added, subtracted, multiplied, or divide, just like other equations. In this problem, we are given two functions, f of x, which is x squared plus 3x plus 1, and a different function, g of x, which is equal to 4x plus 2. When working with more than one function, we give each function a different letter in order to keep them apart. To find the value of f of 5 plus g of 5, I would first find f of 5 by substituting 5 for x, which would give me 5 squared plus 3 times 5 plus 1, so I get f of 5 equals 41. I then find g of 5 by substituting 5 into the g of x function. So 4 times 5 plus 2 yields a g of 5 of 22. Since my problem was to add f of 5 plus g of 5, I use substitution. I allow 41 to represent f of 5, 22 gets substituted for g of 5, and when I add them together, I get 63. We can also find something called a composite function, and this is finding the function of a function. From the same example as before, I'm using f of x and g of x, the same two functions, but this time I am asked to find f of g of 5. When finding a composite function, we start from the inside, so first I'm going to find g of 5. You'll recall from the last example that when I plug in 5 to g of x, g of 5 equals 22. Looking back at my original problem, f of g of 5, I am now going to replace the g of 5 with 22. So I'm effectively finding f of 22, which is going to be 22 squared plus 3 times 22 plus 1, which means that f of 22 equals 551. Therefore, f of g of 5 equals 551. This is what your first page of notes should look like when completed. If needed, take a moment to pause and catch up. Our next new topic is the vertical line test. If any vertical line passes through more than one point of a graph, then that relation is not a function. We're going to take a look at several graphs and determine whether or not these graphs are functions. In this first example, my graph is represented by this red line. And using the vertical line test, I'm interested in determining if I were to draw a vertical line anywhere on this graph, would a single vertical line cross the red graph more than once? Here I can show you a variety of vertical lines that could be drawn. And as you can see, each of these lines crosses the graph only once. So yes, this is a function. In this graph, I'm given a parabola. So I have this red line represented as a parabola. If I were to draw a vertical line at x is 0, right here on the axes, I would cross this function only once. If I let x be 1 and drew a, a vertical line, I would again cross only once. So you'll see that there's a variety of vertical lines that I could draw, but none of these vertical lines would cross the graph more than once. So yes, this too is a function. In this example, my graph is an oval. If I were to draw a graph at x equals 1, or draw a vertical line at x equals 1, I would actually cross this oval twice. And as you can see, there's a wide variety of vertical lines that can be drawn, and many of these would cross this oval twice. So no, this is not a function. We have several more examples on this slide as well. This is a horizontal line. If you think about this critically for a moment, it should be impossible to find any vertical line that would cross a horizontal line, this horizontal line, more than once. So as you can see here, it is indeed a function. 
this graph is a vertical line. So of course, if I drew a vertical line in the very same location, it would cross this graph in an infinite number of points. So vertical lines are never functions. In this case, I have a parabola turned on its side. So if I were to draw a variety of vertical lines, many of these lines would touch the red graph twice at the same time. Therefore, this is not a function. And in this example, I have a cubic function, which makes a line with a saddle point. But again, if I draw a vertical line anywhere on this graph, I am not able to touch the red line more than once for each vertical line. So again, this one is indeed a function. This is what your second page of notes should look like when completed. Our last topic is arithmetic sequences. A sequence is simply a set of numbers. An arithmetic sequence is a special sequence in which a numerical pattern that increases or decreases at a constant rate occurs. In arithmetic sequences, A sub 1 is used to denote the first term in an arithmetic sequence. The common difference is the difference between the terms in an arithmetic sequence. It is a constant rate of change, and we use lowercase d to represent the common difference. When using arithmetic sequences, we are commonly asked to find, is a sequence arithmetic? And what you need to do, to do is determine if the difference between the numbers is a constant. In this first example, I have the sequence negative 6, negative 3, 0, 3, 6, and 9. So I look at the difference between the numbers. As I progress from the first term, I am adding positive 3 to get the next term. So yes, this is an arithmetic difference, and D, the common difference, is 3. In this next example, I have the numbers negative 4, negative 2, 1, 5, and 10. In order to progress from negative 4 to negative 2, I'm adding 2. From negative 2 to 1, I'm adding 3. Then I'm adding 4, and then I'm adding 5. So this is not a constant difference. Therefore, no, this sequence is not arithmetic. In my third example, I am starting at 74 and progressing to 67, to 60, to 53. Take a moment and determine is the difference between each number constant. If you found that the difference from 74 to 67 and from 67 to 60, etc., is minus 7, you are correct. This is constant, so yes, it is arithmetic, and the common difference is negative 7 because I'm subtracting 7 to get the next term. Another common problem associated with arithmetic sequences is to find a given term. We use the formula a sub n equals a sub 1 plus n minus 1 in parentheses times d. In this formula, n represents the number of the term you want to find. It is not the value of the term, but it's which term in the sequence and we use subscripts to denote the terms. So a sub 1 is the first term in an arithmetic sequence. a sub 2 would be the second term, a sub 3 the third term, a sub 10 would be the tenth term, a sub 100 would be the one hundredth term, and so a sub n represents the nth term. In this formula, d is the common difference. In example 14, if I am given the sequence negative 3, 3, 9, and 15, and I am asked to find the tenth term, I will use the formula a sub n equals a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times d. Remember that a sub 1 is the first term in the sequence, so in this case it's negative 3. d is the common difference, so you have to look at the sequence to figure that out. And I can note that from negative 3 to 3, to 9 to 15 is a positive 6, so d is 6. And n, of course, is the, is the term I want to find. In this case, it's 10 for the 10th term. 
So I'm going to substitute a sub 1, d and n into my formula. I get a sub 10 equals a sub 10 equals negative 3 plus 10 minus 1 times 6. I can simplify that to be a sub 10 equals negative 3 plus 9 times 6, which comes out to be a sub 10 equals 51. What that means is if I took this original sequence and I continued on, the 10th term in the sequence would be 51. This would be a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, etc., all the way to a sub 10. This is what the third and last pages of notes for this week's video should look like when completed. If needed, please take a moment to jot down all of this information. Thank you for watching this Wybark production.